Hi there and welcome. Um, as we continue today, we're thinking a little bit about um, the last two, we're thinking about the last three chapters of the um, book of the Gospel of Luke. And we've got an interesting theme. We're coming up to Christmas. It's Christmas Eve now. I'm even wearing my Christmas jumper and here at the food bank, you might even be able to hear, not food bank, the soup kitchen, you might even be able to hear carols in the background. And it's thinking, we're thinking today about Christ's birth on the day that actually, when we read the next, these next two chapters, 23 and 22 and 23, we're thinking about Jesus' death. And interestingly, we've separated the two in our minds. Easter, Easter and Christmas have become far away, as though they're almost hard to believe it's the same person. That great theologian, um, Billy Connolly, um, was telling of his grandson when he was talking about um, the Christmas story and telling his little grandson the Christmas story. And then he told him about Easter and you suddenly saw his, his the little child's mind start working out and he said they killed baby Jesus the shock of it they killed baby Jesus baby Jesus this beautiful baby in the manger what happened to him what happened next they killed him they killed him and interestingly everybody laughed when um, Billy Connolly was telling that story why because the truth is we keep those stories so apart we don't think of the baby in the manger being the man upon the cross. The two images, are the two juxtapositions, if you like, are too uncomfortable to cope with. In fact, I think it's interesting, the only two times we cope with Jesus as a society is when he's born before he talks and when he's finally silenced when he's dead. We don't like to cope with the bits he said either side of that, pre and post resurrection, if you like. And Luke builds up to the passion narrative this, this, where Jesus dies, and he, and he tells the story, not so much a lengthy picture of the crucifixion, sometimes, and in other gospels, Luke, uh, Mark especially, they do a really gory depiction of the crucifixion to make us all feel, oh dear, that was really gross and really violent and really horrible. And sometimes I've had preaching like that, where it just makes you feel really guilty that your sin caused Jesus to die. Interestingly though, um, I think there's a, I think that's actually not a good way of theolo doing theology. There was a, a hymn, a fairly famous hymn, that says, it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. Actually, that's bad theology. It wasn't my sin that held Jesus there. My sin's not that powerful. It's his love that chose to die for me that held him there. Love was what held him there. Jesus was not compelled by my sin. His love was a choice. For me. And as we think about these last two stories, we see these last two chapters, we see it starting off with Judas agreeing to betray Jesus. Again, imagine we've all had those experiences of someone we've loved, of someone we've cared about, of someone who was meant to be on our side, giving up on us or turning away from us or um, walking out on us or stabbing us in the back. Uh, Judas did it for, for money, he says another, another gospel for 30 pieces of silver. And then Jesus was saying to his disciples, he, he gave them this picture of his body broken and his, and his and blood shed, you know, in the first communion picture. Um, and then moments later, they're arguing in Luke's gospel about who is the greatest. And you must be thinking, I'm about to die and I'm about to pass this on to these guys. And they simply haven't got it. You know, that kind of thing where you're thinking, I've got to make that moment, that step of faith. And the people I need to be ready aren't ready. And that goes even, that's even compounded by the fact that Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and he needs them. He needs them to be ready. He needs them to support him. He's lonely. He's struggling. He's, he's in his most vulnerable place we ever read of Jesus, really. And what happens? They fall asleep. They fall asleep. And earlier he hears... Um, Peter giving him all of that, you know, how we probably all do on a Sunday night at church, you know, with all the songs and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, God, I'll love you forever. And yet on Sunday morning, so often we struggle and it's harder and difficult to actually be a follower of Jesus in all the choices that we make. And then um, Jesus turns to Peter and says, actually tonight, three times before the cock crows, you will deny me. We then see that the, um, the whole story continue to, to, to pan out from the Lord's Supper to a rest in the garden to Jesus praying on the Mount of Olives to Peter actually disowning Jesus three times and then being mocked by the guards who hit him as they prophesy, prophesy with his blindfold on. They're, they're, they're mocking him and then 
Jesus meets before Pilate and Herod. The chief priests say, are you the Messiah? If so, tell us. But Jesus says, if I tell you, you wouldn't believe me. You see, what he knows is, what he knows is that actually people don't ask questions often. They phrase their own opinion with a question mark on the end of it. They'd already made up their mind that Jesus wasn't genuine. Or if he was, they didn't want to hear from him. They have already made up their mind of what they thought should happen. This wasn't an investigation for truth. This was trying to deal with their own conscience. And they condemned Jesus to death. The passage continues. As it continues with Jesus before Pilate being asked if he's the king of the Jews. Pilate tries to, tries to let him off, but the crowd keeps shouting, keeps shouting, crucify, crucify. And, um, and again, we see um, Pilate trying to let him off, but there's a choice between Barabbas or between Jesus. And again, this is an interesting choice because actually when anyone who's read the gospel of Luke up until now will know that's not the choice that Luke's giving us. It is a choice, but the choice is actually between Jesus and Caiaphas, the high priest who's lurking in the shadows. The Caiaphas, the high priest, is this sort of, um, almost the sort of sneaky figure underneath it all. You can almost see, you know, there. And they're saying, that's the choice. Are we going to be the, the religious people that preserve the status quo, that preserve, that, that, that like things how it are, that, that are judgmental, that all, all this, all this kind of way that's not the way of Jesus, what Jesus calls the broad way where many, where many follow. Or are we going to be, or are we going to choose Jesus, which is the unlikelier choice, the tougher choice, the difficult choice, the choice that calls us to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. And then we see Jesus stumbling under his cross and Simon of Cyrene, a guy, um, a, a probably from Africa, an African probably, carrying the cross with Jesus. And I think there's a great picture there where Jesus was probably praying, Lord God, I can't do this. In fact, he says that, you know, if it's possible, take this cup away from me. And he needs God's strength to help him do it. But he also needs a human being to walk alongside him to help him doing it. And that's a picture we both need God's help and, a human, and, and one another's help to follow Jesus, to carry our cross. And we see that passage ends with two criminals either side of Jesus. And what we, hang on, um, just going to pause this for a second. Sorry, sorry. So as we continue through the um, passage, um, we see Jesus crucified with um, next to him on his, um, he has two, two criminals. One of, again, this illustration of two choices. Who are we going to be in the story? That seems to be one of Luke's continued um, motifs, if you like. Who are you going to be in the story? Are you going to be choosing Jesus or Barabbas? You can be choosing the way of violence, the way of whatever we're going to be choosing the way of Jesus. We're going to be choosing Jesus. We're going to be choosing Caiaphas. And then we see right at the end, we see a, um, a choice between the two, the two thieves either, either side of Jesus. One says, um, one, says, one says, remember me, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly today you'll be with me in paradise. And that there's something that makes me realize I don't understand who's in heaven and who isn't. I haven't got any clever answers really, other than the fact that I know that Jesus, when he died and rose again, opened the way. And even though that guy was like literally minutes, maybe even seconds away from death, that Jesus was still able to save him by the act he was doing. But I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's... I haven't got any clever answers anymore. I used to think I was very clever. I don't anymore. But there's a verse in the Bible that said, God's ear is not deaf to our call or his arm too short to save. I also think as if we go back, um, I lost my train of thought um, earlier, that um, when we see Pilate make, wanting to make the right decision, and yet the pressure got to him, and he ended up making the wrong decision. I was thinking, what of us? What of this message today? There's so many pressures to make bad choices there's so many pressures to go in opposite directions there's so much pressure but actually what are we going to do are we going to make the right choice or the wrong choice are we going to do the right thing or the wrong thing are we going to go jesus's way or our own way are we going to choose barabbas or jesus are we going to choose caiaphas or jesus are we going to be like the thief that received eternal life 
we're going to be like the thief who died next to Jesus with no assurance of hope. Interestingly, too, um, you know, we see Pilate make a bit of a statement of faith, saying, this is the king of the Jews written above, above um, Jesus' head, and he wouldn't change it. We also see at the very end, we see that the temple curtain torn in two. Again, this is a very Jewish picture, because the, the, the temple curtain separated the pure from the impure, the in from the out, the Gentile from the Jew, broken open and saying the way to God is open. Anyone and everyone can come to God because of Jesus. Torn not from the bottom to the top, but the top to the bottom. Jesus says, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit as he died. And a centurion watching it, watching the death of Jesus, got a conviction and thought, surely this was a righteous man. Another translation says, surely this was the son of God. The women, the women from Galilee followed him, and now Jesus is buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And the women who come from Galilee followed Joseph and laid and prepared his body. Interestingly, there is no reference to any of the disciples being with Jesus, but yet there's stories of the women being there. So this, um, this Christmas Eve, as we think about Jesus' birth, Today also we think about, in our passage, we think about his death. Jesus, who was born, lived and died. Too often we try and make Jesus' birth sanitized like a, a one-off story. And one of our assemblies recently we did, we held up a videotape and we said that in olden days when we used to use videotapes, we used to stop the tape, the bit we wanted to watch, or we used to fast forward it. Too often I think we stop the tape just after Jesus is born. My challenge for each one of us is let's be people that play the tape, hear the story of Jesus, hear, hear and encounter the death of Jesus, and tomorrow we encounter his resurrection. Or well, later on today we'll encounter his resurrection, we'll probably do it tonight. Thinking that Jesus was born, died, and is alive today. Jesus' death cannot be divorced from his birth. Jesus came to do something and his mission culminated with a death on the cross for you and for me, that each one of us can be forgiven.